Hello friends, this is Self-Critical Automaton, your Let's Play Generating Algorithm, and today it's time for episode 9 of my Dishonored Let's Play. So here we are in the incredibly scenic and atmospheric backyard of the uh, Grand Abbey building here in Dunwall, which is their base of operations in this part of the world, if not their greatest holy place, I think. Um, and yeah, so I'm picking up exactly where I left off. One of the advantages to height is that you can observe. So we know there's two groups of um, man and dog exploring or patrolling around in that sort of area. We know that there's one guy standing by himself over there. There's another pair who patrol that way over there. I believe there's another pair patrolling here. There are a ton of these guys around. But for, before we do anything else, it's time to perform. My favourite trick, the high-speed abduction. So this is completely irrelevant, I don't need to knock this guy out. But if I fuck up and uh, get spotted, removing that guy makes it take them a lot longer to raise the alarm. Because that over there... Uh, I don't have the zoom lens yet, but that is an alarm system, and if one of them sets it off, um, that would be bad for all of the reasons why alarm systems are bad for people sneaking around them. So yeah, um... That is some money. I might try and steal that in a second. If I uh, if that guy leaves his back to me long enough. Now, uh, yeah, so I wanted to talk about the... Um, I tell you what, it'll be smarter to do it afterwards. So what I'm going to talk about right now is just the semiotics of mask wearing. So all of these, all of these people, all of the foot soldiers of this um, militant organisation, all of the actual members of this religion wear these masks. Those masks are modelled on the face of their leader, but um, the semiotics of mask wearing are pretty clear. Um, externally, it represents them as being, you know, all the same. They are all the same. They are all brothers in, in their religion. They are all brothers in their society. Um, but externally, this also means they have a sort of a, a shared responsibility you know, they have to do terrible things to achieve their their ostensibly for the greater good goals. Um, so any of them could be any of them. They are literally called the Abbey of the Everyman, so naturally they all look identical. There's a few other um, aspects to this, because they do also represent the ideal of mankind. The, um, the, they believe that they are potentially the pin the pinnacle of what humanity can be without relying on things like witchcraft. But uh, yeah, these things all tie into one another, and it also is very convenient for a fascist organization to be able to hide the faces of its members. They are known by name, of course, but um, zero zero hesitation, zero discomfort. That is the power of the indoctrination that these people are under. I don't know if you've ever tried to piss while a dog is watching you, but it's uncomfortable, man. It's so uncomfortable, and he did not flinch even slightly. Anyway, um... You're just feeling off. That's all. It's no use. I'm sick. I can taste blood. It's been days. You know what you have to do. Stop it! I'll give you my share of elixir. Nonsense. I don't want to bleed from the eyes and lose my mind. I don't want to spread the plague to anyone else. Don't fall prey to restless hands. I'm asking you to do this because you've known me for so long. Can you do it? Will you? Yes, my friend. I will. Before you weep. Before you bring down the rest of us. Thank you. Turn your back, my friend. Recite the seven strictures. I will make it fast. Restrict the wandering eyes that look hither and yonder for some flashing thing that easily catches. But brings calamity in the next. There's kind of a fundamental dissonance in these sorts of games. You get these little scripted scenes, but then uh, the moment the scripted scene is finished, you get the sort of inherent comedy of, um... Ah, oh, come on. 
So, uh, this trick will be a lot easier to pull off when um, we eventually get the upgraded version of slow time and we can get away with uh, just knocking people out without needing to um, time it right. I wasn't quite standing in, right the in the right position to knock him out, but it's fine. I had darts to make up for it even though I'm running low on them now. Um, I mentioned uh, in comments of a previous episode that there is no difference uh, between being dead and being alive, uh, or being dead and being knocked out in Dishonored. Stealth games usually have um, very little difference because it's simpler to just essentially have the same kind of animation states but rely on them as being a to you know, a toggle that changes your points at the end of the chapter based on whether you actually killed them or whether you merely knocked them out. But um, it's just so much simpler for everybody if knocking something out removes them from the board permanently, even though this is incredibly sort of disingenuous and unrealistic for a stealth game. You should have to care about whether people might wake up. And uh, some of the most legendary stealth games do this, like um, Metal Gear Solid, for example. The Metal Gear Solid games definitely do that. There are also uh, games where, you know, if you knock someone out, they're knocked out permanently, but, you know, if someone else wakes them up, they wake back up again. I think uh, the Hitman games tend to do that. Anyway, uh, just a side note, there is somewhere in here a copy of The Young Prince of Tivia, which is um, a very erotic work, which I believe I pointed out previously, so it's kind of amusing that uh, here in the bunkhouse of this incredibly strict religion, with, you know, it's incredibly prudish tenets, we happen to have um, someone hiding their pawn basically under their bed, which is <laughs> it's just kind of funny. That's just a reminder about the uh, the combination because you know every time there are these like really high security back here, huh? Every time there are these like um... do you know what? I cannot remember what I was going to say. So let's move on. So uh, this was two o seven maybe? No, two o three. It's not a conveniently no low number, that's far less irritating to have to input than any others. How, how, uh, how very magnanimous of them to use such a low numeral code. That is very much an easier option for me. So, what am I missing? Just that, it looks like. Can't help but feel like I've missed a rune somewhere. In addition to the one I'm not getting for not doing Granny's insane quest. Um, regardless, so, um, the thing about, um, the Hammerites is that, well, I'll talk later about the very direct, like, DNA through line from, from Thief and from Looking Glass Studios to Arcane and Dishonored, but in the original Thief game, there is, there is a religious group which is very much presented as being very similar to, you know, medieval Christian church, and they are unambiguously the good guys in that first game. They're, um, that game came out in 1998, so it's it's kind of more in character for someone of that age to have, you know, crusaders or whatever be good guys. Um, as historically questionable as that is. Excerpt from the diary of a known heretic seized before his execution. For most, the outsider is nothing but a child's tale meant to instill fear beyond the family of the, and the community. When I was young, my mother and I were on the run, moving from village or one village or sea town to the next, camping in the woods for weeks, always the cursed overseers at our backs. At night she told me of her dreams, of the empty place where the outsider whispered to her. With each visit her craft grew, until she could see through the eyes of moths and unlock a door or window latch from outside of a house. I will find this empty place. Somehow the key to open the void will fall into my hands. In time I will learn the secret, and he will be called to me as he called to her. Call me a heretic for my studies, drag me to your cold stone cell, whip my flesh and put me on trial as apostate, burn my body to ash. I will continue to seek the realm of which my mother spoke. It is my life's meaning. So again, we see this incredibly obsessing, corrupting influence in, uh, in the power of magic in this world. Or possibly just in that of the outsider, although, of course, this. I managed to steal one of the charms they were smashing in Warehouse A. Smashing them! Such beautiful and powerful things, and my brothers have no idea. They'll never find me back here, though. Nobody ever comes back here. I can break up the door and they'll never find me. It's all mine. So yeah, um, even the charms, which are unrelated to the outsider, 
themselves have this uh, corrupting, obsessing ability. This ability to make people want to to pay attention to them, to covet them, to steal them and have them all to themselves. I think there's something in this building worth grabbing. But I do not have very many uh, darts left, so I want to try and avoid waking that guy up. He's got his sword out. I think these patrollers always have their swords out. Um, but don't quote me on that. Aha, here we go. It's bottles. Everyone loves bottles. Anyway, so the... Uh, ah, but this is worth coming here for. Sleep dance. Not going through that door, because there's nothing else. So, the Hammerite Church is presented unambiguously as the good guys, in opposition to the pagans whom they hunt. The Hammerite Church... That setting is a kind of a uh, medieval fantasy. Um, I think it's been called medieval punk because it sort of occupies a kind of cyberpunky sort of tone and feel while being very much a medieval setting. Uh, it has electric lighting, but in general, its attitudes, its society, its architecture, it's all medieval. So, um, in that first game, they are presented as being these zealous um, crusaders who protect the people from ghosts and the undead and so on, which is a very common trope, but they are presented as the good guys, and the pagans, who worship nature rather than a, uh, you know, a builder deity. Is that you? Yeah, it's me, don't worry. Um, are very much presented as the bad guys, the villains. You can get down here a lot faster if you just dive into the water, but um, I'm talking, so... Um, yeah, so the pagans are presented very much as the bad guys in that first game, but the developers clearly backtracked on that because the second game um, is actually the reverse. In the first game, you end up siding. You're just an independent thief who gets like caught up in things above his, you know, above his pay grade. Hey, you know, Corvo. it's Samuel. I'm here. Caught up in things far beyond him. Did I grab everything? Yep. But he um, finds himself you know, siding with the with these crusaders in order to prevent the pagans from doing blood sacrifices to summon their god. In the second game, however, the crusader guys are actually the villains and you side with the pagans. And then the third game of the original series is um, all about finding a balance between these two. There is actually a kind of a growth in the, in the writing over the course of that series as they come to understand that both chaos and order are necessary for a society. Total chaos and total um, control are both very bad things for the people who have to live in that society, and a careful balance is what should really be kept. Um, which I think is a sophisticated way to take a very uh, unambiguous take at the beginning. Which is why it's interesting that the um, the opposite is kind of taken here. It's not there's good in both, it's there's bad in both. The, out the outsider is a corrupting force. Magic is a fundamentally corrupting force. However, um, this society built in order to keep it under control is incredibly unambiguously evil. It is both sides, but not there is value in both sides. It is both sides and both sides are kind of awful because most of the witches we meet will be doing terrible things. Most of the people who carve bone charms or covet them do terrible things with them. And the outsiders do terrible things constantly, as we've seen. Anyway, hey Sam, what's up? Um, thanks for being my one-man audience for this monologue. From the way I hear it, Campbell lived a pretty posh life. Maybe it's not my place to say, but men of the faith shouldn't live like barons. Are you ready to go? Yeah, get me the hell out of here. I think, okay, I, I, think I did everything. Except Granny Rags' horrible side quest. Runes found six out of seven. That seventh rune is the one you get as a reward for the second stage of Granny's quest, which, as I said, I'm not doing. Hostiles killed four. That's decently low. Dead or unconscious bodies found nine. That's way higher than I would like, but at least no alarms were rung. Um, rescued Griff. Branded Campbell as heretic. Saved Kernow. Saved Elsa from Zealous Overseers. Um short by about a thousand coins which is pretty much that's the average that's part of the course you never find all the coins and i found everything else that we wanted so that went well martin is on his way to join the loyalists and campbell's fate has thrown the overseers into disarray 
Decoding the High Overseer's journal may reveal any number of strategic secrets, most notably the location of the rightful heir to the throne, Emily Caldwin. Admiral Havelock and Lord Pendleton are in the courtyard. I expect they'll want to congratulate you. So I mentioned before that this game has an all-star cast for some reason that I don't understand. Um, I mentioned that Susan Sarandon plays Granny Rags, but I don't know if I mentioned that uh, Callista Kernow. He's alive. Thank you, Corvo. Thank you. My uncle's a good man, and one day he'll prove it. She's played by Lena Headey. Here. I know you did this for the right reasons, but I want you to take this as a reward. It's an old heirloom one of my aunts gave me. I wonder if she says you did it did it for the wrong reasons if you happen to be uh, on high chaos. Good to know there's no more charms that have appeared. That's the only real change that happens between missions. There are occasionally little side tasks for you to do around in this area, and occasionally there's one or two new valuable things to grab. But uh, a big exploration isn't needed any anymore. Yes. Hopefully the High Overseer is the first step along that path. And we must find a girl. Emily. Who knows what her mind is like, being there when her mother was killed. I'd imagine the daughter of an empress is tougher than you think. Mm, quite right. In any case, we won't get the Lord Regent until we weaken his base. All the pieces are in play. He controls the city watch. Through Campbell, he had the religious faction. Someone is funding the military. And he currently has a majority in Parliament. Yes, I'm aware of that. My brothers control the voting block for my family. I'm very much aware of that. So all of the great movers and shakers in this conspiracy um, are doing it for their own reasons. They don't care about the people, they don't care about Emily. Except possibly for Havelock. He seems to genuinely care about Emily as a person, and he seems to be a genuine patriot who just cares about bringing stability to his country, even if he goes about it ultimately in a highly questionable way. But... Um, Trevor, Trevor is absolutely in this for the political power and the control and to get one over on his shitty brothers that he hates. These kind of selfish motives are everywhere in this game because this is a horrible crap sack society which um, is in a horrible crap sack setting. It's supposed to be dreary and grim in, you know, grand like Victorian um, fictional tradition. But uh, let's go see what they want me to do. Actually, let's see what the heart has to say. Oh. You did it. Somehow you took down the High Overseer Campbell against the odds. I knew you were our man, Corvo. With Campbell gone, we've hurt the Lord Regent immeasurably. And with Martin back, we'll have the finest strategist alive. The Lord Regent must be shitting himself in Dunwall Tower. Yes, and Campbell's journal, let's not forget. Our hope is that in these encoded pages, the location and condition of Emily Caldwin can be discovered. Our entire movement will mean nothing if we can't place the rightful heir on the throne. We must act fast. No doubt the Lord Regent is holding Emily somewhere, waiting to reveal her, to step out as the hero and further cement his regency. If he doesn't bring the young lady forth soon, there will be infighting among the nobles as to who should succeed the Empress. Yes, time is against us. But now you should take a well-earned rest, Corvo. We will decipher the contents of the High Overseer's journal and share them with you later. Um, I can do everything I need to on the next day, I think. Such as sneak around using the heart on them. Makes that noise every time you wake up, even if there's no uh, like outsider thing happening, which is kind of funny to me. It's such a oh, you've woken up and something is strange and different. You do occasionally find little gifts in here that people have sent to you for 
doing your uh, terrible, terrible things that you do. I don't think there's anything else. In fact, I'm not even going to bother looking around because I know there isn't anything else to find. You maybe get one or two extra bottles of whale oil or whatever other small, low-value treasures there are to find, but... I know the golden cap. Not as a patron, mind you. I designed some specialized devices for them. I kept the blueprints, if anyone is curious. Don't. I brought you tea as a courtesy to a colleague. I won't make that mistake in the future. I'm sorry. I only thought... Never mind what I thought. Thank you for the tea. I have to get back to the Admiral. He has news for me. So, uh, in my first bonus episode, I called Piero pervert. That's um, not unfair. He is a creepy man who is who creeps on women. We will later see that this is incredibly true. Generally speaking, he's an unpleasant man and unpleasant to be around. Much like Trevor. Much like. Mm, I mean, all of the members of the conspiracy are bad people, except for the little people. This game has kind of a tre like tremendous respect for the little people, the small people, the um, the people who are assumed to be simple cogs in a machine by those in charge, but who actually do have their own agency and their own right to change things and their own right to make a difference and their capacity to do so, which often surprises the people in charge. Which itself is almost a kind of a Victorian concept. This, ex well, hmm, okay, let's call. <laughs> let's not go with that. But where the hell has Havelock gone? She and her uncle, the last of the Karnak family. She dreams of freedom, and then the decks of the whaling ships fast after the beasts of the sea. But alas. She's a woman. So, this brings me to a point which I haven't made yet, but which I will probably return to another time. Ah, see, here we go, one bottle of whale oil. Cousin Anna, Morgan and Custis continue to resist my efforts and are lo no longer responding to my letters. The servants tell me they've been absent for the manor for weeks. My brothers have always been arrogant, utterly convinced of their own certainty, and they don't really give two figs for anyone else in the world unless they want something and can't take it outright. But this disagreement over the upcoming parliamentary vote has reached a crisis point. Up till now, the Lord Regent has been somewhat restrained in his authority, at least where the holdings of the gentry are concerned. If Morgan and Custis vote in his favour, the law will be changed and we will all be at risk, aristocracy or not. I implore you, if you know where they are, to speak with them. So, yeah, Trevor Pendleton, he wants his bro brother's voting block and his inheritance. He wants these for the obvious reasons that will bring him power, but also that it will allow, allow him to retain aristocratic power, um rather than powers being devolved or removed to the, to the state. Chapter 32. As yet I have said little of my brothers Morgan and Custis. Twins they are, four years senior to me. Morgan is the larger of the two brutes by a slight bit. From earliest memory they abused me in every way. I'm not the first to claim their elder siblings were cruel, but my suffering was unique. I promise you. At the tender age of five, they tied me to the crib and set inside it assorted vipers they had collected over several weeks. My house and my breathing were muffled by a blanket, and so it was hours before the nurse found me barely alive. I had kicked a few serpents to a pulp and others had slithered away, but not before I'd been bitten a dozen times or more on my legs, arms, face. The wounds kept me convalescing for months while those two got away with barely a tongue lashing. Wallace! Bring me wine. <clears throat> Tomorrow I will regale you with the special gift they gave me on my 10th birthday. Party. So yeah, he had a shitty life, but that doesn't necessarily mean uh, it's okay for him to do the things he does. So, god, what was I talking about? Um... The irony of saying this brings me to something and then getting completely distracted and having no idea what the fuck it was I was going to say. Oh well, oh well, oh well. So, these two are out here. Uh, was it something to do with the plight of the working man? Was it something to do with the nobility of, 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 of the working class in the face of an aristocracy? Um, these are themes that are very common in... in um, 
fiction set in these sorts of eras, but I cannot for the life of me remember what I was going to say. Hello, Corvo. I expect Martin will be joining us shortly. I hate to start your day with such a strange matter, but the servants heard something last night, moving through the storm drains beneath the building. Most likely a weeper, the poor bastard. There's no hope for them once the plague gets that far along. Nothing more than a shuffling corpse full of sickness and insects, if you ask me. I'd appreciate you investigating, just to be sure it's not a nosy guardsman that's getting too close. Here's a key to the hatches. I'd send a servant down there, but they'd die of fear on the spot, I'm afraid. Maybe Piero can concoct some sort of sleep poison for your crossbow if you want to go that route. Well, why don't you do it, huh? Big brave soldier man. Making me go get down into the sewer and fight things. If they're afraid and you're mocking them for being afraid, why aren't you doing it, huh? Huh? Big man? Big brave soldier man? Anyway, uh... So there are two weepers down here, and there are also two, um of these to pick up, as you can see. Not only because weepers count as civilians and therefore uh, killing them will increase your chaos by a fair chunk, but also there is a... I think it's an unmarked side quest. I think it just does, does not mention this at all, but if you dart them both and they go unconscious and you leave them down here... Piero? is very pleased and he congratulates you for having uh, obtained for him some uh, you know living late stage weeper specimens so that he can basically be like you know doing dissectional things because he's a bad man um, although I'm sure that these people would be willing to donate their bodies to medical science in the hope of getting some kind of better better resistance to the plague. Yeah, that's not really interesting. Um, because that is kind of um, what happens. You find a note by your bedside and a bundle of knockout darts and he's like, hey! Good job uh, knocking out those poor bastards. How can I... There we go. Uh-oh. So this is a bit of an unfortunate glitch. Um... He's with Admiral Havelock now. They want to talk to you. So I got close enough to trigger her um, Elder Scrolls Oblivion style crash zoom conversation technique, but uh, I was I fell back down. So yeah, that's a fun glitch that can happen. Corvo, I trust you remember Martin, an overseer before and perhaps again someday soon. I owe you thanks for my rescue. Indeed. You've given us a glimmer of hope, Corvo. Because we've gotten what we've wanted from Campbell's journey. You've done it. We know where Emily Caldwin is being held. The Golden Cat, of all places. A bathhouse for aristocrats. Little better than a cursed brothel. But there's an unfortunate twist. It appears that Pendleton's own kinsmen stand in our way. The twins, Morgan and Custis. Not only are they controlling Emily, but they have the controlling parliamentary votes we so desperately need. Yes, the Pendletons have to die. But most importantly, Emily must be brought here safely so we can protect her until the Lord Regent and his entourage have been dealt with. Well, Pendleton's waiting for you on the dock. He's asked to brief you personally. I think it's best. Well, fair enough. Um... Sure, I'm always happy to sheathe my blade in the blood of the aristocracy. Who who gives a shit? Corvo, a moment if I may. Corvo, I've asked to speak to you myself. You see, I'm sending you to kill my older brothers, Morgan and Custis. They're horrible men. It's true, as you may have heard, cruel beyond words. Further, my brothers are close allies to the Lord Regent, and as long as they are in Parliament, we cannot gather the votes we'll need to stop the Lord Regent from further consolidating his power. These days, they're best known for exploiting their favor with him to cheat others out of their wealth. Let's just say that not every family evicted in quarantine for having the plague actually has the plague. I warned my brothers in every way I could. I really did. But they never did listen to me. They'll be at the Golden Cat tonight at their usual revels. They'll be protected by the City Watch. 
so it'll be dangerous. Now go. Please do it before I change my mind. So these people all give you their noble high reasoning about why it's good that we do these things and why it's necessary and why it's important, but um, while those reasons are almost always true, those reasons are given to cloak the ultimately selfish reasons that they're actually doing it. To think, Lord Pendleton is the son of nobility, but one so steeped in courtly manners. His thoughts do linger long on revenge and murder. Case in point. This is all about getting back at his shitty bullying brothers. Which I guess is not an unreasonable thing to do. Anyway, let's have a look at Martin. Do, do not be deceived by his talk of strictures. Martin's cries weigh heavy on his spirit. He has been a soldier, a highway robber, and a man of faith. Let's take a quick look at Piero while we're having the... Uh, you know, afternoon spirit sensing fun times. Before the sun rises, they toss any casualties into the river. Men or hound. They all go. That has nothing to do with Piero. They top off the line with river water. I guess she just has nothing to say about Piero today. Then fresh bottles are fetched from the cellars. Which is irritating, if you ask me. I want secrets. Tell me things. A frequency reverberation that confounds some of my experiments. I suspect there are some kind of empty chambers beneath this building. In a district this old, it's possible. So he's just telling you that there's empty rooms underneath, which is true because we've just been in there. I wonder if anyone will tell me off for doing this. Oh, didn't go as far as I thought it would. They normally explode, too. Look, I've, I've got to make my own fun, alright? Like, they keep asking me to do stuff. I come home, I go to sleep, I wake up, I kill people. Like, come home, I go to sleep, I wake up, I kill people. i got to entertain myself somehow. Right, let's talk to Piero and then be off. Porvo, my friend. Do you need ammunition or weaponry? Would you like me to craft something for you? So, I've bought a couple of non-lethal upgrades, including one that lets me do this, which is useful. Um, and I've topped up my non-lethal supplies, and that's everything. We are ready to go to the Golden Cat, which is one of the iconic missions in the game, and um, one of the examples of kind of the purest immersive sim level design that I think are around, really. So join me next time for uh, the first episode of oh, that well, part of my Let's Play, well. and we will go see some of the... Uh, one of the best levels in this game, which is one of the best games. Thank you so much for listening, or Better watching, or whatever. Bridge prison, ain't it? You're chatty today, aren't you? Anyway, uh, yeah, so thanks for watching. Goodbye. If you like this, you can also follow me on Twitter for updates, stream announcements, and one-tweet micro-reviews, or why not donate to me via Patreon or Ko-fi, or just share my work. Thank you so much for watching.